All right, welcome to Medium Choices. Um, not necessarily the best choice, but not definitely far from the worst choice. The only reason this would be a bad choice uh, to, to read this book is just because of all the other books that are, exist. When there's literally infinite books, uh, it's always going to be probably not the best choice to just pick one out uh, when you could have picked out another. So um, th this, is, this is definitely a good choice. I can say that with some confidence. Are there better choices? Yes, definitely for sure. So, um, but it, it's definitely a better choice to make a video for this than it is to do nothing. So let me do a white noise check. All right, so it looks like I went all the way down to zero uh, and then the, the mic levels look good. I have to do that because somehow I get this white noise on there and I don't know, it might not even, that might not even be a appropriate way to, to check it. But uh, yeah, so the last video we, uh, uh, got the um, we got the lab uh, topology like the layers uh, layer one sorted out on it um, we had to make a lot of uh, pretty tricky decisions um, unfortunately there's no way really to have links greater than 10 gig in my lab um, oh and we got a new version of uh, GNS3 um, so so the lab I've got is kind of um, you know it doesn't have the 100 gig links that that we really need in the core it's got 10 so it's really not what you would see in the real world but i mean <laughs> there's a reason why enterprise networks like this end up costing quite a bit <laughs> so i can't quite do everything in my lab but we've got all the essentials we've got the data center we've got uh, what the floor would look like. Uh, we've got access to the internet through firewalls, and then we've got access to the WAN. I'm not really sure what that's all about. I guess what that would look like more is if we had uh, another floor here in another building, then we would we would connect that up to the WAN here. Um, so uh, so yeah, everything everything's good to go. Uh, layer one. So. Next step is uh, layer two. We need to make all, sure that all these links are up and that they're operating at the, the correct uh, link speed, uh, full duplex, all of that. They auto negotiated correctly. Uh, then on to, uh, yeah, then, then on to layer three, we've got to assign them all an IP address uh, so that they have in-band management uh, connectivity. Uh, layer four, we need to set up uh, routing table, route it, routes on them, uh, routing protocols, design it like a enterprise system would be designed. So probably like, uh, I don't know, something like OSPF through the WAN. Uh, I, I think that's where we'd have BGP. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just have to have some conversations with the AI probably and then work through the book. Uh, layer five, what is that? Please do not throw sausage so that's the session layer um I'm not really sure what's involved with that and then p presentation not sure what's involved with that application layer i think that's like getting like full ssh access i don't know let me let me actually ask the ai because this is this is going to be really uh really awesome uh i i love the ai so much it's like because these are questions i've had my whole career is like how do you how do you think about the osi model in you know this specific context and it's like it's been hard for me to really like pin that down so like the ai will, will help me do that okay so i'm in gns3 and i've got all my devices that i want to use in my lab to simulate a enterprise network now what I think I've accomplished in this regard is I've accomplished layer one according to the OSI model. I've dropped all my devices and I've cabled them up and now I can turn the devices on. So I think that now I need to accomplish layer two which would be like making sure layer TWO, layer two to like make sure that the link speeds are what I want them. I want basically the highest link speed I can get in the core, which unfortunately in my lab is like 10 gigabytes, or sorry, gigabits. 
but that would be layer two is getting all the links up. Layer three would be getting all the IP addresses on them. Uh, layer four would be layer four, the number four would be the transport layer. So now here's where I'm starting to get confused. So please tell me continuing this line of thinking, what would I configure in my lab to successfully co configure all layers of the OSI model in my lab? Where does SSH, SNMP, NTP, DNS, DH3, DHCP, and other essential protocol protocols fit in? create for me a table of the layers of the OSI model and then for each row in the table that corresponds to the OSI model layer the protocols that I need to configure in my lab to simulate a full enterprise network what a world we live in isn't that amazing just to be able to ask that to something you're on the right track with setting up your simulated enterprise network isn't this beautiful? Here's a table to help you map out which protocols and configurations you need at each layer of the OSI model. This is wonderful. OSI layer layer name configuration, protocol 7 application layer HTTP, HTTPS less than BR, greater than SMTP less than BR, greater than SNMP less than BR, greater than DNS less than BR, greater than DHCP less than BR, greater than FTP less than BR, greater than SSH6 presentation layer SSL, TLS, for encryption, 5 session layer NetBIOS less than BR, greater than PPTP what's, less than BR, greater than RPC4 transport layer TCP less than BR, greater than UDP less than BR, greater than SCTP3 network layer IP, yeah. IPv4, IPv6, less than BR, greater than ICMP less than SMP, BR, yeah. greater than OSPF less than BR, greater than EIGRP less than BR, greater than BGP less than BR, greater than SAC routing. SSH, yeah. Two data link layer Ethernet less than BR, greater than PPP less than BR, greater than SDP less than BR, greater than DLAN less than BR, greater than LACP1 physical layer cabling less than BR, greater than switching hardware layer wise configuration. Physical layer, layer 1. Since you are using GNS3, this layer is simulated yeah. by connecting devices using cables. Right. Data link layer, layer 2. Configure Ethernet settings. Set up DLANs for segmenting network traffic. Yeah. Implement STP, spanning tree protocol, to prevent loops. Yes. Configure link aggregation using LACP where higher bandwidth is needed. Network layer, layer 3. Assign IP addresses to interfaces. Set up stack groups or dynamic routing protocols, OSPF, EIGRP, BGP, for connectivity between different network segments. Configure ICMP for diagnostic and troubleshooting purposes. Transport layer, layer 4. Here, you will be primarily concerned with the transport protocols like TCP and UDP, which are automatically implemented when configuring upper layer protocols and services. Yeah. Session layer, layer 5. Configure RPC for inter-process communication. If VPNs are a part of your lab, configure PPTP at this layer. Presentation layer, layer 6. If your lab involves web services or any application that requires secure communication, configure SSL, TLS. Application layer, layer 7. Set up DNS for name resolution. Configure DHCP for dynamic IP address assignment. Configure SNMP for network management. Set up SSH for secure remote access. Configure HTTP, HTTPS if web services are a part of your lab. Implement any other application layer protocols relevant to your simulated enterprise network. This is a general cool. guide and may need to be adjusted based on the specific requirements and goals of your lab. Keep in mind that some protocols and services span multiple layers, and the categorization is not always strict. Yeah, that's great. This is, this is exactly what I was looking for. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was I was right about my my intuition for like what you know each what what belongs at each layer is is correct. It's just sometimes. Uh oh yeah, it's like secure TCP or something like that. It's it's a it's a transmission protocol. So like the session layer would be like uh. What's NetBIOS? Layer network. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and then RPC. RPC is like um, remote procedure call. To execute in a different locations. Okay. But yeah, okay. What a world we live in. I, I just love that I can act ask that and get get an answer that like i don't know you know it, it's 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 a good answer it's a better answer i could get from any human all right so uh let's move on uh and uh keep reading so so we got it we got our uh network set up um we've got the core layer connecting to a distribution layer connecting to an access layer um 
our access layer only has uh, two switches, but we can uh, we can expand out the access layer as much as we want. Um, and yeah, so well, let me let me look at that book again. So yeah, we can we can expand it out as much as we want with redundant links back to the back to the distribution layer. So if we were to add two more switches. We just uh, make more redundant links. I'm kind of tempted to to do that because the uh, it looks like the yeah they're just kind of I mean this almost looks like the data center, but I don't know. Let's just keep reading. So start gathering information. So start automating the network. Go to TFS. Create a new work item called uh, campus underscore iOS underscore facts. Move it to active create a new branch called campus underscore iOS underscore facts perform a git pull to refresh the local repository change to campus underscore facts branch change to that branch uh, just created the one you just created using get checkout okay so uh, yeah so let's do that so um, we're gonna go uh, to uh, the TFS, so that's uh, Azure DevOps. Yep, looks good to me. And then sign in. All right, and then go to my uh, account. or my dashboard probably. Uh, maybe my GitHub profile? No, that's not it. Uh, how do I get to my basic uh, like projects and stuff? Um, I'm pretty sure I actually saved this in the notes. So let's look at the notes. Uh, so this is the readme here. Oh yeah, here it is. Perfect. All right. So if you're on the job, make sure you have that link somewhere. <laughs> and it looks like, oops, uh, that, that could be why I couldn't find it. Oh, you know what? It's because I, I changed it. All right. So let's update the notes. Okay, and we'll do a version control commit on that. So, Azure dev project name was changed. Breaking URL in dot. All right, looks good to me. So what's the next step here? So okay, so now now we're gonna follow along with with the book. So what does the book say to do next? All right, so the book says to start automating the network. Now we'll probably have some precursor steps we need to take before we do this, but uh, we'll 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 do it under the work ticket. So we're gonna create a new work item. And uh, now, do we want it to be an epic? Do we want it to be a task? Let's see what we did with the last work item. Okay, so the last work item, um, it's in state done. It looks like it was a task. Yes, so let's create a new task. Okay, so the task is going to be um, now we'll we'll call it campus facts because it's not it's not all Cisco it's it's a it's a multi vendor thing so we're, we're gonna call it campus facts instead of campus Cisco facts and then we'll uh, assign it to myself save and close all right so uh, and then and then let's look at it on the board. Uh,
Okay, so if we go to Assigned Me, there we go. We can see a Campus Facts. Um, I wish there was a way to put it on the uh, the actual board. Uh, we'll definitely add a uh, link to the repo for it. Yeah. And we can add a um, add an existing work item. Yeah. So parents, uh, pro, a, a successor. Let's call it a successor because it it depends on the initial repo config. So it's a successor to to this. It's something that comes after we completed that. All right, so we'll save it. See, I wish I could get it on the board is the problem. Uh, but, you, but I guess on the board, all you see are issues and epics. You don't see tasks on the board, which is probably a good reason to, um, to do, do it under epics. All right, so, but anyways, we can we can see it without looking at the board if we just go to um, work items. There we go, and it's right there. So, um, so now what we're gonna do is, uh, okay, we've got this inactive, we've got our task. So we're gonna create a new branch in our um, repository. So let's go to the repository here. We'll go to branches. Okay, we've got the main branch, so we're gonna click new branch. And the new branch is going to be called, uh, let's call it network facts instead of, oh, it's, yeah, so we're going to call it campus facts. And it's going to be based on the main. So we click uh, create. All right, and then we make sure that our um, local repository in our lab has, has this change we made uh, here. So let's do that. And it says that a network connection failed. That's going to be a problem. Definitely have to fix that. Uh, so let's, let's try to ping out to google.com. Uh, oh, so yeah, we do definitely do have an issue here with like, uh, with GNN, with, um, with internet connectivity. All right, not sure what's happening uh, with the internet connectivity. Let's see if the issue is just with DNS. So we're going to ping the number address. So we'll ping, we can ping 1.1.1.1 now because it's been reallocated to uh, Cloudflare. Used to be not the best address to ping, but now it's totally fine. Um, so. Yeah, so we, we have an issue with uh, internet connectivity right now. Uh, so I guess I guess what I want to try doing is um, oh, and this thing is so annoying. I want to try getting rid of the link and then adding it again. Sometimes that'll clear up some issues. Okay, so now we can see that made uh, that made this change a bit. So 
So see now we're connecting. Uh, looks like it's still trying to connect. So I think there's something up with the, with, with this internet cloud here. All right, yeah, not sure what's going on here. Um, I'm almost wondering if maybe it could be the case that, uh, I mean, honestly, we're not even supposed to be, um, Used. So, yeah, it keeps it keeps refreshing it. Let's turn it off. Back on. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, the Wireshark capture of the link. We should see a bunch of DHCP traffic. I uh, don't see any DHCP traffic. That's a problem. <laughs> That's probably why it's not working. Oh, there we go. There's there's one. Yeah, so it's something wrong with that cloud um, icon I have on there. Um, so uh, let's just try dropping a new one. Uh, so we're gonna, we'll just drop this one here called cloud and then, uh, we'll add interfaces to it. Oh, it's already got four interfaces to it. So yeah, let's try dropping another link to that and we can, we can just destroy this. So we're going to stop the capture, shut this down. All right, and now now let's see. So this is this is connected. Oh, okay, yeah. So so there's some some sort of issue with um. There's some sort of issue with how it's uh. Because now now we can ping it. So we just had to like recreate the cloud. I think the DNS is probably good as well. Yeah. So there's just you know this this is the what what is this is the fun part of working with uh virtualization just sometimes it acts kind of weird so we can we can delete these two links delete delete and then delete this cloud yes and then rename this to internet all right and then put it here and uh, put the links back. Okay, and uh, now hopefully I, I retain my internet access. So it looks like I do. Um, and I can do a, a sudo apt get update. on my package manager yep and everything's working perfect okay so yeah that's just D uh, uh, gns sometimes will do you like that but it's easy to uh overcome so uh yeah so now we need to do a uh get a pull on on the local repository and i'm not sure if i have local repository let's open up visual studio code see what i got going 
We don't need to see this anymore. Uh, it'll it'll kill the process. It looks like we do have quite a bit of updates needed. Uh, there we go. Now it's done. All right, so let's do a ls. Go into documents. I think that's usually where I have it. Yeah, so we've got it. Uh, oh, now the thing is to remember, we have the uh, we have the repo that I'm using to read the book. So this is where it gets uh, tricky and where, where it's really important to understand what's going on. We have two repos right now. We have we have three repos of significance, and I'll tell you we, I'll tell you about all three. So the first one that has significance is the original repo by John Capobianco on his GitHub that contains his book. The second repo that has significance is the fork that we made of that repo in my own personal GitHub. But now we have an entirely new repo that's unrelated to either repo, and that's the repo we created in Azure DevOps. And technically there's actually a fourth repo as well, and that's the uh, repo uh, of John Cabo Bianco's that contains the hands-on exercises. He put that in a separate repo. Uh, when I forked that original repo, all I, what I did is I just added those files to, to the fork of that original repo. So, so I'm, so, so, so you got to understand that which repo is which it's a repo is not a repo is not a repo. They're, they're separate things. Um, you've got to do things like git dash uh, v, uh, or sorry, git uh, uh, yeah, git remote dash v, and you've got to see which which repos you're uh, pulling and pushing to, and make sure that that is accurate. So really important to know that we actually don't need this automate your network repo at all on, on this machine because we're going to be reading the book just on my personal machine here. So, so that's just completely unnecessary to be on the actual lab machine. But the repo that we definitely do need is this uh, Azure uh, repo here. So let's get it. So if we go to repos, click on it. Uh, we can go to, uh, uh, we can click clone okay here we go so now now we see um so let, let's go let's go to this uh url in the uh in the automation server yeah so this is uh what we're oh you know what and this is this is the one that's not um that that's no longer there so let's go back to home there we go. Now, now here's here's the one that we're interested in. So it's a bit leggy since it's a it's virtualized. Internet access is probably worse. It's going to be a lot worse once we go through our slow enterprise network. Um. Now this this says that it's uh, it's private, so I don't know. I don't know why I can't see it. Uh, let's go to let's go to repos. Click on this. There we go. This is this is what I want. So let's click on clone. Uh, so we clicked on clone, nothing happened. Let's click it again. All right, nothing happened again. So, um, so we'll try refreshing the page. All right, and then we'll try clicking clone again. Uh, still nothing. So let's try closing the page here. Maybe that'll make a difference. Uh, still nothing. Okay, so it looks like uh, we don't have the capacity to clone it just by clicking there. That's okay. We can do it in another way. So let's open that uh, page one more time. Okay, and now we can click uh, clone here. 
and uh, we can just type type it in. So what we're doing is uh, let's let's try it through. Um, so yeah, let's just do git clone, and then we'll try it through the HTTPS. Okay, so we've got we've got a problem here. Maybe I spelled something wrong. So uh, so there's some kind of issue here. A U T O M A T D network. Um, yeah, I mean, looks good to me. So I'm not sure what's going on because we can see that does match. Uh, what we have here unless I spelled something wrong dev.azure.com oh you know what I did so I, I forgot this uh, extra section here so um, yeah let's let's take this uh, out of here so that it's easier to read and put it in notepad plus plus one of the greatest um, things ever made or sorry in in just regular notepad plus plus one of the greatest things ever made and then let's um uh put it in um so so let's shrink this so that it that it all displays on the screen and there we go so we got azure.com uh so yeah i entered in the total wrong thing so All right, so there we go. Um, oops, uh, we need my password, which I assume it's the, hopefully it's this. Um, okay, I don't know my password. Um, so let's try it through uh, SSH. Now, notice how this is absent from the book. Um, a lot of these books, I think, really kind of fail to um, adequately prepare you. And unfortunately, it looks like this uh, is kind of no different. Um, now, granted, you know, they're not expecting you to, to do it in such a sophisticated way, possibly, but... Um, this is this is the kind of stuff you really need to learn and you're going to learn it right here on this channel so to to overcome this issue and, and pull it down uh you can do it through https and just remember what your password is <laughs> that's probably the easiest way or you can use ssh keys so if you go uh oh you know what uh, we could probably set up an https personal access token that might work Uh, let's let's do it here because it's um, it responds a lot better. So these can be used. Pass out with this is for API uh, access. So yeah, let's let's get a um. So so this is how it, it works. You add a key. So. Um, So if we go cd ls ls dash a, uh, we should have SSH already. Yes, we do. Yeah. So now we have my uh, public key. So cat id say dot pub. And uh, oh, this is going to be a problem.
Okay, well, I can just do it in here, so it should be fine. So here's my uh, public key. So uh, we're, we're going to give this the name of it in my uh, thing. So it's automation server is what we'll call it. There we go. And it's, it's kind of like, it's a good thing to call it. We can also call it like the TFS server or something like that. And click add. All right, and that's something the book isn't clear about, but just from my own experience, I, I know how to do that. So let's go back to documents, do your history. I'm gonna run uh, command 21 again. And it should work. Uh, so we've got a problem here. Um, okay, so there's, it looks like it's, it looks like something happened with um, with adding this. So let's try adding it again. Okay, so it looks like um, okay. the The good news is um, you can follow the documentation in Azure, and it should it should walk you through that pretty well. Um, the bad news is uh, for some reason I can't uh, I can't get this to work. My uh, public key authentication failed. Uh, because the thing is, like, it it doesn't actually like when I go through all the steps to add the key, it, like it doesn't actually show the key there. Um, so I guess I could try it here. But the problem with that is, um. I don't, I can't, uh, uh, well, here's, here's where it gets cool. So, so let's use the AI for this. This, this should get really cool. Okay. So I have two machines on my LAN and I want to transfer data between the two of them. Basically, I just want to see what my SSH public key is and I want to copy it to the clipboard on my other machine so I can enter it in somewhere so how can I use Python and specifically would I be using the HTTPS module or would I be using something else to just pin up a simple website that I could go to on my LAN to copy the on my local area network, my LAN, so that I can copy the key from any machine I want on my lab. Any machine I want can have can copy that key into the clipboard on that machine. If you want to transfer your SSH public key between two machines in your LAN using Python, you don't necessarily have to create a website. There are simple ways to achieve this. However, if you still want to go the HTTP server route, you can use the HTTP server module in Python to create a simple web server. Here's how you can do it. On the source machine, save your SSH public key into a file, say public underscore key. TXT. Navigate to the directory containing public underscore key. TXT and run a simple HTTP server using Python. SH copy code CD, path, to directory, with key Python 3M HTTP. Yeah, I th this, this is really cool, actually. So, um... So what we can do is uh, go to SSH like that. Okay, and now, now we can do um, Python 3-m HTTP dot server. Uh,
and then uh, actually we need the source. So let's let's do IP dash A, or or let's do IP, IP A. And now now it's going to be at uh, one seventy two dot one sixty eight dot one dot five. or 192.168.1.5 and we can see uh oh we actually do have a apache enable on here i forgot that i set that up um but let's let's uh start that uh server again all right and now see what we get all right, so it looks like uh, we're not we're not getting the the results that we want, and I think I think that's because um, if we do if we do um, Python three dash m http dot server uh, and then like help or like yeah there we go uh, we can specify. A, a bind a bind address so dash dash bind oh uh it's it's the wrong port it's going to be port uh, 8000 and there we go now we've got uh the public key here um, and then it can go into my uh, clipboard. There we go. And now we can add it uh, on this side. So pretty cool, huh? I like that. Now we can add it and hopefully it's not as glitchy. Yeah, now it's not so glitchy. Um, so, uh, yep. Now, and now we, we stop this. And uh, if we do a, a refresh on, on that, so if we go to the history and go back to uh, where it is. Um, uh, yep, now it's, it's just going to see it's cached there, but uh, we can't access any of the same. Oh, yeah, we can. Uh, wait, I'm confused. Oh no! Okay, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, it it's just I think it was cached. A lot of the stuff was just in the cache. So, um, okay. So now we should be able to download that. Okay, and then history, and then uh, command uh, thirty six was it? No, it's command thirty one. And there we go. See how easy that it is? It's simple as pie. So, okay, so now we've got our uh, TFS folder structure. Um, so uh, let's see what the next thing in the book is. Uh, okay, so so let's do a git branch. Okay, we're, so we're in the main branch. Um, so uh, let's do a git pull. And we just downloaded it, so okay. So we'll do a git checkout on uh, campus facts. Okay, and then we'll do a git status. Uh, looks good. We'll do a git branch. All right, now we can see the two branches. Uh, we couldn't see any branches before. Um, I think that's because your local repository is not the same as your remote repository. And when you when you clone down a uh, remote remote repository, you only clone the main branch, but you can still switch over to the um, other branches on the remote repository. It's just they don't exist until you until you like invoke them by switching over to them which probably makes sense uh, from a size standpoint.
Okay, so there we go. So we so we completed that task. Okay, so the next part is warning. Embedding passwords in plain text is never a good idea, and it's always a security concern. The following practice is not recommend, a recommended practice or best practice, and there are ways specifically vaulting to protect system account passwords that provide access to the network device CLI. For the sake of educating and being able to proceed, proceed without having to fully understand and make vaulting work, use this method for now. Vaulting also prompts for a password at runtime, which may interfere with full uh, automation. And see what I mean? You know, this this is this is this isn't trivial it's like you know this is this is a real you know this book is saying oh automate your network is as easy as pie it's like vaulting it's, it's like you know i just feel like a lot of these books really oversimplify it and then when you sell yourself as a network automation engineer and actually start doing like the things that you do it, it's like it's like over promising under delivering because like yeah that that's a big issue if it asks for a password every time um now the, i would say the best way is to uh use ssh uh keys so you don't have to feed it the password um but let's see what they say so the best option is to harden code into a fresh repository after vaulting passwords and secrets migrate all folders and files without the git history into a fresh repository without passwords being visible to get started either hard code or prompt for credentials an alternative method is to prompt the user for credentials at runtime hard code the service account username and prompt for the password when the ansible playbook is executed this This approach is secure, however, offers less flexibility for full automation as a password is required at runtime. Ansible VARs prompt can be used to create interactive playbooks that prompt the user for username and password. And it's kind of interesting because I don't think he's going to mention SSH keys. I, I would think that would be the best way to do it. Be aware that as soon as Git commits the local changes, the password becomes visible in the clear as part of the branch after a pull request is merged the password becomes available in plain text as part of the master branch this history cannot be deleted this is part of the get version control so yeah you know this is this is not a trivial small thing it's like you're going to put all your passwords up on in this tfs it's like i just feel like sometimes network automation as I said, over promises and under delivers. It's like once you start getting into the down dirty details, you realize things have been the way they've been for the last 40 years, not because there hasn't been some eccentric, brilliant person uh, <laughs> that came around in the last 40 years. It's because there's real hard limitations such as passwords and, and network security that need to be dealt with in in the appropriate way and just putting it all into a <laughs> centralized you know version control thing is might not be the best way to deal with that um but uh i in my opinion the be the best way to deal with that is uh to set up all your devices to uh authenticate via um via uh, SSH keys and then and then have uh, just authorized jump servers for people to work from where they can log in. To, so you, you set up like uh, your devices to only to only accept uh, SSH keys to log in and then uh, you have the authorized devices um, that are accepted uh, in band. So and that and then the best thing you have is is you have a um, an out of band uh, management network that's like set up for like failover. Like if it loses access to tactics. Now a, a hacker can, um, 
a hacker can get into your device and then set up an ACL on it to block access to tactics and force it to fail over. Um, but they can only do that after they've already, after they've already, you know, entered the password they need to, to make changes on the device. Um, but like, let's say that you, you gain access, unauthorized access to, uh, like this, this device here and you know these these are actually set up really well you don't have the password to these devices what you could do is put an acl here uh block access to um the tachex server um oh but i mean it depends on where it's getting that if it's getting it from the data center that's not going to work so um yeah network security is is important let's just say that All right, so, uh, yep, so this is the Ansible Vault. I don't think I'm gonna use that. I think I'm just gonna set up my network for uh, SSH authentication. So then using Vault in Playbooks, uh, how to use Vault to protect sensitive data in Ubuntu. Uh, we might we might be doing that. Um, how Ansible Vault works, uh, Ansible prompts. All right, so the next step is to navigate to uh, forward slash group underscore bars and create a file called all.yaml and replace the username slash password with credentials that will allow Ansible to log into the devices. So we could do that on my um, server here. Uh, we could also do that locally on my computer. Um, uh, if, if we uh, installed another uh, if, if we cloned another instance of, of this, let's just do it here. Um, so if I do code dot, now I open it in Visual Studio Code. I have to type it in correctly though, which is proving to be very difficult. So let's close this down. Uh, then we'll, uh, ow, sorry. Oh, ow, oh my God, okay, okay. Okay, okay. All right, so there we go. So we've got um, this here. So let's go to group vars. Uh, and now let's create a file called all.yml. New file, all.yml. And now we can delete uh, this file here. Okay, and then we need to uh, add some things to to this. Um, so now the thing is, like, we're not only using iOS, so I'm not sure how I want to deal with this. But uh, so yeah, so here here we would be um, we would be replacing the username and password. Um, so I don't think I don't think we're gonna need this file because the way I'm gonna do it is to just allow access through uh, the public key authentication. So so I don't think we're gonna need this file. Um, so uh, yeah, so we can we can save, c commit, annotate, and push the change to the remote uh, branch um, and then navigate to uh, playbooks, uh, uh, campus tactical and create a new file called iosfacts.yaml. So, and then write the following Ansible playbook. And then note for page space and readability, the output path is simply going to be dot forward slash results for all uh, output in the examples to follow. Replace this with the longer path pointing to the documentation folder structure created earlier. For example, dot dot four slash documentation slash iOS slash recon playbook slash iOS facts. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so I guess I guess we could do that. Um, now it's not it's not iOS facts. So I guess I could call it like a network facts. Um, I think that's what I called the ticket. Uh, let me check that.
uh, we called it campus facts. So, um, yeah, let's call it, let's call it campus facts. Um, so first specify the scope of the play, uh, which is hosts and specify two tasks. The task name is in my case, it's going to be campus facts on campus, which will display during runtime, register the output to the variable named iOS underscore facts underscore output. So I'll call that campus facts. And the provider credentials can be found in the variable iOS uh, CLI. So I don't think we'll need that because we won't need credentials in my network. We're just using public key authentication. So uh, copy, uh, copy the content content of the variable iOS underscore facts underscore output and apply the filter. So pipe to nice JSON to the output. Send this output. DST to a file called inventory underscore hostname, a variable that will be replaced at runtime with each device hostname. Finally, append and create the file with underscore iOS underscore facts underscore output as a JavaScript object notation JSON file and in the JSON format. So for more information about uh, JSON, go to the official JSON site. For more information about Ansible filters, visit the Ansible filter site. So here's a playbook in action. Uh, first in a dry, first a dry run in uh, check mode. So they've got all of their um, hosts uh, file set up as well. So this host.ini, uh, they got uh, configured. I need to configure that as well. So I've, I've actually got quite a bit of uh, work to do uh, before uh, I get to this part. Um, the first thing I need to do is establish in-band connectivity to every device on my network from my automation server. And if I'm doing it over the public internet like that, I probably do need to set up my automation server with like a, a VPN. So I, I think that would come from my uh, firewalls probably. Um, so we just feed it admin with no password. And uh, let's do a question mark on it so we can do uh, execute. Uh, is there something about like setting up a VP yeah, VPN? Yeah, so we can set up a SSL VPN, which is at, you know, layer. So like this is, yeah. So we need to do a lot of, uh, unfortunately, network automation has a prerequisite of network health to a certain level, which is really unfortunate because the, I think what most people think of when they think of network automation is how do I get my network up and running in an automated way? Well, the answer is right now with the current methods, you kind of can't. I mean, you kind of can in some ways, but most current methods, you know, this Azure DevOps server, uh, Ansible, they're designed after the fundamentals of the network have already been put in place through methods that are not automated, unfortunately. And that's what I'd like to, I'd like to make a product that, that does that. Um, it'd be like a little device you plug in and would use like, I don't know, I feel like, um, I feel like that's kind of low hanging fruit. I'm surprised that hasn't been um, fixed yet. But yeah, what we would do is we would set up a, a VPN for our a remote worker to, to go through to uh, manage the network. And then uh, for all the devices, uh, their public key would uh, would be uh, uh, would be what is used. If they don't, if something's up with their public key, then they're screwed, they're locked out. So don't mess up your public key. And if you do, you won't be able to access anything. That's kind of, you know, I'd be a strict, uh, administrator because security is important. So, uh, yeah, so let's not worry about that VPN right now. Uh, let's focus on getting just the basics, uh, set up in my network. Um, so we need, we need like an IP addressing scheme. Uh, we need, uh, yeah, we need a lot. We need, we need to do full, CCIE level network architecture on this, our network design. So uh, let's see here, we're on page 109. Are they gonna, I wonder if I can piece it together from, 
yeah so like here's here's what they got in the book but you know it's um it's not the same topology it's just it's just i gotta go it on my own for this so let's go back to 109 and then um yeah so that's that's i'm gonna leave that for now um uh, and when when we come back we'll have we'll have this um but uh right now uh let's let's do this so let's take the um let's take the lab uh okay and then um the first thing i need to do is is to build out my host.ini file so let's let's work with the um ai and try to do that okay so i need to create a hosts.ini hosts.ini file for ansible can you help me with this sure i can help you create a host any file for ansible this file is used to define the host servers you will be managing using ansible the hosts any file is also known as the inventory file here is a simple example of what hosts any file might look like in this example we have two groups defined web server and database each group contains a list of hosts the ansible underscore ssh underscore user is an example of a host variable and it defines the ssh user ansible should use when connecting to the host here's a breakdown of the example web server this is a group of hosts any hosts listed under this heading are part of the web server group 192 168 1 10 ansible underscore ssh underscore user equals ubuntu this line defines a host in the web server group with ip 192 168 1 10 and specifies that ansible should use the ubuntu user for ssh connections database this is another group of hosts any hosts listed under this heading are part of the database group. 192. 168. 1. 20 ansible underscore ssh underscore user equals root. This line defines a host in the database group with IP 192. 168. 1. 20. And specifies that ansible should use the root user for ssh connections. Depending on your specific... All right. So... Yeah. So so this, this, is, this is like what I need to do. So um, how about this? So how about this? this I type out to you a description of my network and then you create a hosts.ini file for me based on that Ugh. If there are any logical groupings of servers for example web servers databases etc yeah okay so let's let's do this so uh, so my campus network uh, section one. All right, so section one data center. Uh, And then we're gonna say devices. So we're gonna say DC 01 7K 1 DC 01 N 7K 1 uh, 2. And this is DC 02. And the thing is these aren't these aren't even 7Ks, these are these are 9Ks. Yeah, so I, I should abandon this scheme and come up with my own. So DC01, yeah, and these are 5Ks. I do not have 5Ks either. And this is A, DC01, N5, K, a and this is this is two and then we can save some time like this okay and then now we've got um yeah these are named really weird as well so two i think some of this is probably a mistake in the book and you know this is just from right from the book i really need to be uh doing it this so so there's section one data center 
From the names, it seems like these could be Cisco Nexus switches, N7K and N5K series. Here is a simple host. Any file that represents your data center network. Since no specific SSH users or additional variables are provided. Yeah, so... Oh, that's that's good. You could give it uh, SSH users. So the thing is, can you please rename this? So can you please... So can you please rename this? It just came from a book called Automate Your Network by John Capobianco. And I'm running this in GNS3 and I don't have all the images in the book. So the images that I'm using for the distribution are Cisco Nexus 9500s. And then what I'm using for the leaves in this topology are Cumulus Linux images. I think that is all I am using Yes, I am. I am using the Cumulus Linux images uh, for my uh, for my Leaf devices. So, can you please create a new naming scheme based on the images I'm actually using and based on what best practices naming for a data center is typically? I can help you come up with a new naming scheme based on the equipment and topology you're using. In a typical data center, naming conventions are critical for clarity and manageability. Given that you are using Cisco Nexus 9500 for distribution and Cumulus Linux images for leaf devices, here's a proposed naming convention. Distribution switches, Cisco Nexus 9500. Prefix. DS model. N9K identifier. Unique number or identifier for each switch example. DSN 9K01, DSN 9K02 leaf switches, Cumulus Linux. Prefix. LS model. CML, short for Cumulus, identifier, unique number or identifier for each switch example. LSCML01, okay, LSCML02, LSCML03. This naming convention starts with a prefix indicating the role of the device in the network, DS for distribution switch, LS for leaf switch, followed by the model of the device, and finally a unique identifier, usually a number, for each device in its category. Based on the devices you listed, here's how they might be renamed following the proposed naming convention. This naming convention is consistent and scalable. If you add more devices of the same or different types, you can easily integrate them into this naming scheme. Of course, you can adjust the prefixes, model identifiers, or numbering to better suit your preferences or existing conventions. Yeah, I, I like this. Okay, so we're gonna do that. And we're gonna do that. Okay, and then, and now, yeah, see how much more straightforward this is? Uh, I like it. So and then these are leaf switches. Okay, and we're gonna go uh, one through four. All right, there we go. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a much better <laughs> name. So, uh, I think we I think we can use this in our in our host's ini file right now. So, uh, let's go to the oh, and and the thing is, yeah, I think we I think we gotta we gotta clone it down to uh, my local machine because we won't be able to share the clipboard from the ChatGPT unless we're using ChatGPT in the virtual machine, but the virtual machine's laggy because it's a virtual machine and I'm accessing it uh, over Wi-Fi too. It's not just directly on my uh, PC. So like, yeah, l let's do that. So um, let's do that right now. So, so the first thing we're gonna do, um, and we, we can we can we're kind of getting a, ahead of ourselves with with this now. So let's let's uh, revert all these changes. Okay, and then um, and then let's uh, pull this down, uh, switch to that branch, and then update the host.ini file. So we can even just completely uh, exit out of that. I do need to uh, end the video very soon, so uh, uh, I'll try to uh, get going on this. So let's open uh, Ubuntu. Um, and then, uh, oh, you know what? This isn't, this doesn't make sense. Uh, let's, let's open, um, command prompt. We're going to go to, uh, documents. Uh, and now, now the, um, yeah. So the automate your network, uh, repo is there. So we're going to pull down uh, the the other repo. Um, so uh, let's do that. So we might have we'll probably have to upload another SSH key. That's okay. Um, we can do that. So let's go to repos. 
and let's go to clone uh yeah i think we're gonna have to uh well let's let's try let's try cloning in uh visual studio code so we're opening visual studio code um yes okay so now we need to choose where we want to clone it let's clone it to documents uh select as repository uh destination there we go so it's it's works uh pretty well and then we need to log into the microsoft account oops uh that's not my uh okay and now i need my microsoft uh password okay clicking authorize uh okay i think i got my password wrong uh SSH is, I think, is way easier. Okay, yeah, SSH is easier. Let's use SSH. So we're gonna have to add another key to it. Let's do that. New key, and we'll say we'll say uh, home or main PC. Say, we'll call it home PC. Yeah, and now we'll uh, do the um, SSH key. All right, and then I will have to leave. I will have to end the video after this. Okay, that looks good. So now we're gonna go uh, back to the repo. And we'll do a uh, clone. There we go. Uh, okay, and I did I did HTTPS, which was not what I was intending to do. Um, so uh, let's do clone again. There we go. Now we got to switch it over. Okay, and now we can do a get clone. And hit yes. And there we go. Uh, a lot easier. So uh, this is Graham's automated network. So now we can do a code dot on it. And now we've got uh, both of our repos open, the repo that we have the book stored at and that we have the uh, examples and then the repo that I am actually using to uh, configure my lab network. So let's host the, open the host INI file. Um, well, before we do that, let's, let's switch the branches. So we'll do a git branch. Okay, and then we'll do a git uh, checkout. And I forget what that branch is named, but we can see it right here, it's named campus facts. Okay, so now let's do a git branch again. All right, that looks a lot better. And we'll edit the INI file with uh, what we got from our, um, from our, um, uh, conversation with the AI. Okay, so this naming convention is consistent. Yeah, so um, what is the difference between having data center be in lowercase or being in uppercase letters? Is it okay if I just put them in uppercase letters if I want or will there be 
repercussions of that that I need to consider. Enhance. Oh, I have memory okay. files, group names are case sensitive, which means data center and data center would be considered different groups. However, whether you use lowercase or uppercase letters for group names in your hosts. Uh, let's use uppercase because then it will it will match uh, what's in the lab. I won't have to change it there. So it's uppercase in the lab. So let's put it that way in the INI file. All right, and that that looks good to me. Um, so we're gonna go and uh, stage that, and then we're gonna make a message say uh, building out INI hosts.ini section by section uh, data center yeah so commit sync changes and uh, yep that's it for the video thanks for watching see you in the next one I gotta head off somewhere so um, yeah making good progress on this uh, when I come back we'll uh, keep working on that INI file so thanks for watching see you in the next one